I'd like to uh, say that we are having to improvise our program somewhat because um, some participants have been unable to get here. Um, the bulletin indicates that Elder and Mrs. Ted Jones should be with us and we're still hopeful that they will make it. Um, he's trying hard to get here, but we're going to carry on. I'd like to introduce the participants that we have with us so far. I was sitting in church one Sabbath and behind me were some very lovely voices singing the hymns and uh, as usual I take advantage of any opportunity and I uh, slipped them a note and asked them if they would be willing to participate with us in Sabbath school and you know they're here this morning. <laughs> Jeffrey and Jeffrey Hyde and David Meyer, they are AUC students. Uh, and you will be hearing from them as we progress in the program. Last week's emphasis was on compassion. If you recall, some of you were here when we showed the slide, the uh, video on AIDS and had the uh, discussion following that. Um, the thing that came forward in that whole program was a call to compassion. Today we want to look at four hymns, not Christmas hymns in the traditional sense, but songs that tell us about compassion, about a compassionate Savior who came into the world, taught us the true meaning of love, and the true meaning of compassion. As a departure from the usual format of singing the hymns, I'm going to suggest today you're a nice cozy group here and we can uh, do something a little differently. I'm suggesting that you silently read the hymns, take out your hymnals, and as the hymn stories are given and as the um, songs are played on the piano, we're not going to sing this morning. I want you to, I'm suggesting that you read silently those hymns. And not only read them silently, but as you read the words, think about what the hymns really mean to you personally. You will find that the people who wrote these hymns the, the hymns had a special meaning to them, and I'm sure that they want the hymns to have also a special meaning to us. A young lady was recently asked to sing a song at her boss's funeral. She wondered what song would be appropriate to sing at the funeral services of a Jewish man. She finally talked to his widow and asked if there was any particular song she might like. And her reply was, yes, could you please sing Amazing Grace? After the funeral, the widow came to this young lady and thanked her so much and, and told her what a blessing that song had been to her. And many other people came that day also and, and told her of the blessing. Our first hymn story is about Amazing Grace. The hymn Amazing Grace by John Newton. Newton lost his mother before age seven. His father remarried and several years of schooling, after several years of schooling, he joined his father's ship as a seaman. Much of his time at sea was spent collecting slaves from the mainland of West Africa slaves to sell to traders. He later became captain of his own slave ship, capturing, transporting, and selling slaves to the plantations in the West Indies and America. Uh, excuse me, selling slaves in the West Indies. This was looked upon as a cruel and vicious life. On March 10, 1748, Newton was returning to England from Africa during a storm when it appeared that all would be lost 
Newton began reading Thomas Kemp's Imitation of Christ, a religious classic. The Holy Spirit, through the message of this book and the frightening sea, sowed the seeds leading to Newton's conversion and later acceptance of Christ. Strangely enough, Newton continued as a slave ship captain, trying to justify his work by improving working conditions, even holding worship services for his hardened crew. Eventually, Newton was convicted that his work was inhumane, and he became a crusader for Christ and against slavery. This led to his return to England and his marriage and his subsequent study for the ministry. At 39, he was ordained by the Anglican Church and began pastorate in all England. This lasted for 15 years. During that time, he spent much of his time telling of his own conversion story, which gathered large crowds. He also departed from the custom of singing psalms, as was practiced in the Anglican Church, he sang hymns that expressed the faith of his preaching. Newton spent the remaining 28 years of his life as pastor of the London St. Mary's Woolnan. Newton's wife died of cancer in 1790, and he died in 1807. And his great message that stood out before his death was this, I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great savior. In a churchyard in England, a granite tombstone bears the following inscription. John Newton, clerk, once an infidel, a servant of slavers in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And our guests have arrived, and I see Elder Jones is ready to, to take over here. So he will play for us Amazing Grace. The second hymn story today is about Rock of Ages, written by Augustus M. Toplady. Augustus Toplady was born in Farnham, England on November 4, 1740. He was the son of Major Richard Toplady, who died in the service when Augustus was an infant. Toplady later graduated from Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland. He was ordained in 1762, 
in the Anglican Church and became known as a powerful evangelical preacher. He became converted at age 16 in the midst of a handful of people in a barn. Surely this was the Lord's doing, he thought. This hymn has been ranked one of the most popular ever written and has been described as the hymn that meets the spiritual needs of all mankind. It was sung at Prime Minister Gladstone's funeral in Westminster Abbey. Toplady published the hymn in 1776 entitled, A Living and Dying Prayer for the Holiest Believer in the World. Toplady was highly respected and deeply spiritual. His final statements just before his death indicates his deep spirituality. My heart beats every day stronger and stronger for glory. Sickness is no affliction. Pain is no cause. Death itself no dissolution. My prayers are now all converted into praise. Toplady died of tuberculosis and overwork at age 38. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4 says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that our fathers did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. The third hymn we have this morning is What a Friend We Have in Jesus by Joseph M. Scriven. Someone has said, a Christian's practical theology is often his hymnology. Many of us can recall an experience when a simple hymn used by the Holy Spirit ministered to our spiritual needs. This hymn is not considered as great as a great literary writing, but has brought solace and comfort to countless numbers of God's people. Many missionaries state that it is one of the first hymns taught to new converts. Scriven, the author, was born in Ireland of prosperous parents and was a graduate of Trinity College. He left his country at age 25 and migrated to Canada. The reasons for his leaving? Because of his religious beliefs, he lost his family, and he tragically experienced a major loss when his fiancée accidentally drowned the night before his wedding. It was these experiences that led him to follow the Sermon on the Mount literally. He gave freely of his limited possessions, even sharing the clothing from his own body when necessary. One of the ways Scriven shared himself with the widows, the poor, and the sick was by sawing wood and delivering it to them. What a Friend We Have in Jesus was never intended for publication, as it was written as a letter of comfort to his sick mother. Some time later, a friend visiting him saw the poem scribbled on scratch paper near his bed. The friend read it and asked if Scriven had written it. He replied, the Lord and I did it between us. 
Ironically, Scriven, as his fiancée, died also by accidental drowning. The citizens of Port Hope, Ontario, erected a monument on the highway with the text Proverbs 1824 and the following inscription. Four miles north of Pengelly Cemetery lies the philanthropist and the author of this great masterpiece. Proverbs 1824 states, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Ira D. Shanky discovered the hymn in 1875, which became the most favorite of Scriven's collection, and he included in his own collection Shanky's Gospel Hymn, number one. The fourth and final hymn this morning is Jesus Loves Me by Anna B. Warner. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. Mark 10, 16. Jesus Loves Me is a hymn that has influenced children for Christ more than any other. The text was written in 1869 by Anna Warner in conjunction with her sister. It was part of a best-selling novel of that day. One of the characters of this novel, depicted by Mr. Linden, comforts a dying child with this poem. The hymn remains a favorite of children all over the world. Anna and Susan Warner were highly educated and devout Christians. They lived most of their lives along the Hudson River in New York, near West Point. They conducted Sabbath school, Sunday school classes, rather, for young cadets. After the death of their father, a well-known New York lawyer, the, ch the sisters were left with a meager income. This turned them seriously to literary writing. Anna's sister, Susan, became well known for several of her works. However, Anna's popularity from Jesus Loves Me went beyond America and was told by missionaries to every culture. Missionaries have reported hearing groups in Buddhist temples singing, Buddha Loves Me, Yes, Buddha Loves Me. The music for this text was composed by Dr. Danbury in 1861, who personally added the chorus to the four stanzas, Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. And he took them up in his arm, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. Mark 10:16.
was Elder, and this is Ted Jones, and I'm very thankful to have them. Did you enjoy having the participants this morning? Let's give them a hearty amen. Amen. Thank you so much for braving the storm. I had nightmares that there wouldn't be anyone here this morning. Praise the Lord. <laughs> you came. <laughs> I hope you will get an extra blessing today. We are endeavoring to continue our Sabbath school with the goal in mind of making it more of a fellowship than a program. I don't even like to call it a program. I would, I would rather think of it in other terms because we're not here to entertain you. We're here to share with you. And uh, this morning we've been taken uh, back and I hope that it has helped you to think about the season that we are approaching and that we are already in. We have seen and heard of God's amazing grace and his friendship to us and certainly his love for us. Shall we bow our heads for the closing prayer? Father in heaven, we do thank you for your Holy Spirit, for your amazing grace. And we know that you are the rock of ages. And we know that you love each and every one of us. We thank you for the participants this morning who braved the storm and came to share their love with us. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. Protect us as we go through the day today. And Give us a blessing for the service to come. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, everyone. First, I would like to announce the, some of the few changes that had been in the program. First, uh, the um, call to community will be done by myself. Um, the Old Testament reading, uh, Jeremiah, will be done by the Gerardis family. The morning prayer will be done by Dr. Eubanks. And everything else seems to be the same. Uh, there's an announcement also about the deacons and deaconesses. They will have a meeting right after service, which will be downstairs at the fellowship hall. Uh, there was originally be, uh, supposed to be a padlock, but it's not going to be that way. It's going to be a really short meeting, and uh, everyone is expected to be there, all deacons and deaconesses. We would like to give you a welcome to everyone, which we know that uh, you have been really brave to come here this morning. Uh, it's been really really tough out there with all this wind, but we're glad you're here. And so we hope that you can enjoy the, this morning's program that we have. And uh, at this time, we would like to thank God and also greet everyone. So please greet everyone that you have on the side. Julian and I are the understudies for the Nixon family. <clears throat> Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock, and driven them away, and have not bestowed care on them. I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely, do what is just and right in the land, and in his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. I invite you to turn in your bulletins to the call to worship and read responsively. Rejoice with great joy and singing for you shall see the glory of God. God has promised to come to us, gather us, and lead us. God breaks into the deserts of our despairs with springs of water to quench our thirst.
Let us pray. O oh God, on a morning like this, we're reminded of what you said in Scripture, that as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so my word that goes out from my mouth that will not return to me empty will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So we claim that promise today, that what we see around us will not only water the earth, but that your word, as we've been reminded here, will accomplish its purpose as well in our hearts. We're grateful for the message of Christmas, for this Advent reminder of your love and care, and pray that those of us here gathered, though few in number, will experience that special blessing that this season brings. We think of the absent loved ones and members of our congregation and pray the same for them where they are this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Almighty God, we come before you this morning asking that the promise of washing us as white as snow or whiter than snow be fulfilled in our lives. Thank you, dear Jesus, for this beautiful song of following Jesus. We want to walk his way, love his truth, and 
live his life. Father, we ask for a special blessing this morning on every person present here. Please come with your Holy Spirit and fill our hearts and thoughts, our aims and will transformed. Please make us, dear Jesus, according to your will. We give ourselves completely again to you, totally, mind, soul, and body. Please, Jesus, bless this service in a special way. Help us to be nourished from your word. Bless our Elder Nixon in a special way today. Bless those that are sick and are, and are and at home. Please bless them in a special way today, dear Lord. All your family, your children here present, gathered, children, young, adult, older ones. Thank you, Jesus, Jesus, for hearing us today. We come realizing that Jesus is our only hope. In him we live and move and have our being. Lord, we ask again for your Holy Spirit as we think of the Advent. We pray that your Holy Spirit comes in, come into our lives and let Jesus come to us today that we will be ready to see him when he comes the second time. Bless us and forgive us for all our sins and make us Christ-like in every way of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, thank you, Carol Choir and Dr. Ness, for providing our worship music today. I was watching some brave souls on my unplowed street in Lemonster fighting their way to get out of their garages this morning. They didn't have their church clothes on, so wherever they were going, I know it wasn't more important than where I had to go. <laughs> so I made a determination I was going to get here somehow. And John Nozak called me and brought his four-wheel drive over and 
We had one little skid there that was a little scary, but we got here safely and so have you. And we thank God for the privilege of being together this Sabbath morning, especially under these conditions. Perhaps you have noticed, maybe last week, maybe you're just noticing this week, that we have made some progress with some of the problems with our lighting here in the sanctuary. The scaffolding is still up and we apologize for that, but the work is not yet finished and it's too much work to take it apart and put it back together again, so we left it intact. And we do want to thank the men and women of our church who have been working to get this problem solved. Their effort, combined with your generosity, has made it possible to do what has been done so far, and all the work will be accomplished soon by God's grace. The Lord has given us a great trust in permitting the work of God to be determined by our generosity and our faithfulness. He has left it in our hands. Each Sabbath when we come together, we come to show to God that we can be trusted with his gifts and that we appreciate his grace in our lives and this Sabbath is no different. Here is what he said through the writer of the Proverbs. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your increase. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. May God's blessing be unto us as we come with our gifts another Sabbath morning.
thank you, O oh God, for accepting what we have. Bless it now and use it to your own glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And now is the time for us to go forward with our children's story. We'd like to invite all the children to come down as David Meyer comes forward to give our children their Sabbath story. Come right forward to the front. Good morning, guys. Didn't we try this last week? Okay, let's try this one more time. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. A lot better. How many of you like the snow that we have this morning? Do you guys like that? Remember last week that there was some snow on the ground? And we had a lot of fun in the children's story, right? Well, there's a, there's a rule with my children's stories. The more snow's on the ground, the more fun we have. So we're going to have a lot of fun this week. Okay? The story this morning. Actually, let's... The more you can't play. Oh, that's too bad. Well, I'm sure you'll play sometime real soon. Okay. Um, <laughs> this morning, we're going to tell a parable. Do you, any of you know what a parable is? No, no, that's a really difficult word. Do you think you know what it is? What? Who thinks they know? It's like a Bible story. Well, that's kind of right. A parable is a story that's told to illustrate something else. Okay? Well, the story we're going to tell this morning is about a group of people, and we have the group of people here. So let me introduce the group of people to you. First, we have a very rich man. Come, rich man. This is a very, very rich man. And this is a very rich man's lovely wife, who loves to hug and kiss the very rich man. <laughs> oh, yuck. Okay. And this is the very rich man's and very rich man's wife, son, who also loves to hug his dad. And so they're a very happy family. Do they look happy to you? Do they look happy? Oh, yeah, I think they look happy. They look very happy. Well, they're also happy because they have some other people in the family. They have some servants. Okay, let's introduce the servants. You guys want to see who the servants are? Yes. Okay, let's find out who the servants are. First, they have one girl servant. This is the girl servant, and she is also very happy. And they also have a guy who's a servant, and he is also very, very happy. That's you. <laughs> he is also very, very happy. So this is one big happy family. So the father took his family and his servants up over there, and they were looking at a piece. They were looking at a big piece of land that had grapes on it. It's called a vineyard. And the man looked around, and he said, you know, this looks like a perfect spot for me to buy, and maybe I could plant some stuff here, and in a few years, I'll get lots of money back from it, because this will be like a great money-making thing. And the son thought it was cool, too, because that would make his allowance go up. So anyway, he was really excited. So the guy decided, the very rich man, and his wife, and his son, and his servants, all decided collectively that it was a good idea to buy the land. And so they bought it. And, they bought, and after they bought it, they needed someone to take care of it. Well, a very sleazy man, a very sleazy man who smiled way too much, <laughs> went over to the very, very rich man. And the very sleazy man shook his hand. And he really charmed the rich man. And the rich man decided that, well, I trust this very, this very sleazy man, so I'll put him in charge of the vineyard. So that's what he did. He put the very sleazy man in charge of the vineyard, and the rich man, his wife, his son, and his servants all left to way beyond the piano, which is a whole other country. Way beyond the piano. And so there they go. And the very sleazy man is very happy because he has a vineyard all to himself. See, he's very... Do you think he's happy? Do you think he's sleazy? Yeah, he's sleazy. Yeah, really sleazy. Anyway... The very sleazy man decided that he would go and take care of his house or something. He just left the vineyard for the day. 
And 10 years went by, 10 long, long years. And the grapes started to poke their heads up through the ground. Boop! And then they started to grow. And then they started to put out shoots. And they put out all these shoots and they tangled all over the place. And pretty soon they had grapes on them. There was little grapes on all the vines. And so it was time to harvest those grapes. And year after year after year, they harvested all those grapes. And they made a lot of money from that vineyard. And so the rich man, knowing that they were probably making a lot of money, decided, I'm going to send one of my servants back to get the money. And so he decided that he would send the girl servant first. He said, I want you to walk all the way back, way beyond the organ to where the vineyard is, and I want you to go collect the money from that very sleazy guy. So the servant left, and she walked, and she walked, and she walked, and she walked, and finally, she approached the vineyard, and she looked around, but she couldn't find the servant. And she looked, and she looked, and she looked, and she just couldn't find him anywhere. But you know what? The servant was creeping up on her. He had a plan. He was going to kill the servant and keep all the money for himself. Oh, no! Oh, no! Watch out! He bonked her on the head. She's dead! Oh, no! So then, the very sleazy man hid the girl way behind the organ so no one would ever find out. Well, the rich man waited a few months and he didn't get his servant back or his money. So what do you think he did? He sent the boy one. I mean, what else could he do? So he had another servant, so he decided he'd send the big boy servant. So the boy slowly started to walk over past the organ to where the vineyard is. And he walked and he walked and he walked and the sleazy guy was, saw him coming way behind the pastor. He saw him coming. And he said to himself, Ah, another servant. Well, if I kill him too, maybe I'll get to keep even more of the money. So he crept up behind the man. Oh no, watch out! Oh no! <laughs> he killed the other servant too. And then Cameron picked, and then <laughs> this very sleazy man picked up the servant and dragged him also way behind the organ so no one would ever find him. Well, a few more weeks passed, and the very rich man didn't know what to do. His wife didn't know what to do either, although she still loved him and still hugged and kissed him. No. <laughs> oh. So the very rich man decided that he would send his son all the way over to the vineyard, and the wife didn't like that idea at all. She thought that was a bad idea, because she was afraid that something happened to the servants, and she didn't want to lose her son. But the very rich man decided that, oh, his son would be okay, and that the man who's at the vineyard would, very, would respect his son, because, I mean, that's a very important person. So the son, very begrudgingly, left on the long journey way past the organ to where the vineyard is. And he walked, and he walked, and he walked. Oh, no, something's going to happen to him. He walked, and he walked, and he walked. <laughs> he was not happy about this at all. And he finally got over to where the vineyard was. And he looked around, and the very sleazy guy figured, I can kill the son, and then I'll have the vineyard all for myself. And so he killed the son. <laughs> and he grabbed the son and dragged the son, too way beyond, way past the organ, so no one would ever find him. And that's the whole story. That's the whole story. The story's all done. But you know what? Like every parable, this represents something else. Now, who do you think the sun represents? Who, who said it? Who said it? Someone over here said it. Jesus. Say it really loud. Jesus. Jesus. That's right. It represents Jesus. Now, who do you think the Father represents? Jesus too? God. Right. God. Well, do you know what, what season is this? What holiday are we going to celebrate really, really soon? Who knows? All together, let's say it all together, really. Christmas! Yay, Christmas. That's right. And on Christmas, we celebrate the birthday or the day that Jesus came to earth. Just like in the story, the day that the Father sent his son here, it's the same thing, kind of. So I want you all to remember that this, this time of year, we all celebrate Jesus' birth. Not just Santa Claus coming and giving us presents, okay? Do you want to say something? What do you want to say? Um, the servants represent prophets. The servants represent prophets. This kid is on the ball. All right, 75. All right. Awesome. Okay, great. You guys can all go back to your seats now, okay? Cool. Santa Claus has claws. He does? Does he? Where does he put them?
patiently, patiently. Today's scripture reading, Matthew 1, 18 through 25, is from the Standard Revised Version. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had borne a son, and he called his name Jesus. This is a very special time of year, and I love this time of year. I, I know that you do too. Not just because it's the time of year when gifts are received, although 
I do admit that when I was a child, that's really what Christmas was all about for me. Trying to find the little hiding places where our parents would hide the gifts until Christmas Day. And not being able to sleep the night before and waking up at the crack of dawn. Every other morning you have a hard time getting up for school, but on that morning, you're up before the sun. But I suppose when we grow and mature, we begin to appreciate Christmas for some other reasons. It seems to be a time of cheer and of joy. I like the lights and the colors and the attitudes that go along with Christmas. Somehow, Merry Christmas sounds even better than Good Morning or Have a Nice Day. And then, of course, it's a time that the children love and a time that we love to be around children. But most of all, it is the time of the story, the Christmas story, the story of when God became human, giving himself as a gift to the human family, and not just a gift for 30 years, but an eternal gift that our family can never lose. There was a story of one teacher who was asking her classroom, her class of small children, what they knew about the Christmas story. And she would ask them questions and they would give the answer. And then she asked, who knows the names of the gifts that the Magi brought to the child Jesus? And one little girl raised her hand, ooh, ooh I know, I know. And she asked her, she picked her. And the little girl said the three gifts were gold, Frankensteins, and Smurfs. <laughs> well, she was close. <laughs> there were no Frankensteins and there were no Smurfs, but there was gold. And not just the gold that the Magi brought, but the pure gold which heaven bestowed in its most precious gift, Jesus Christ. And that's what this time of year is really about celebrating and remembering God's gift in Christ and what that gift means to our living. That's what I want to talk about for a few minutes this morning in this message entitled Real Christmas. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are opening your book now and opening our hearts. We ask you now to cause us to receive what you desire to bestow. Make us truly open to your spirit and your influences that we might be blessed and in turn be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Kay read the Matthew account. I'd like to compare now the Luke account in chapter 2, if you will take your Bible and join me there, of the birth of Jesus. These two gospel writers tell the story with different details and from them both together we get a picture of what that whole incident was like. Let me read from verses 4 to 7 in Luke chapter 2. As you know, the tax law of Caesar sent everyone to their hometowns and so it says in verse 4, Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in strips of cloth, and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. It's a well-known passage depicting a familiar scene. And as soon as we read it, the snapshot appears in our minds. We've seen it a thousand times, the whole nativity picture, the mother, the manger, and the Holy Child. It's perhaps the best known story in the world and the message conveyed in that single picture 
is the world's most vital, second only to Calvary. But have you ever noticed that the biblical account of the birth of Jesus is different from the popular story? In the Christmas of cards and carols, the picture is idyllic and very fanciful. The little family with their halos, the innocent sheep and cows, all is calm and still. We even say silent night. And we are accustomed to thinking of it in just that way. The whole story is so perfect as to be rendered almost fictitious. It doesn't seem real. The stable is in perfect order. The animals are clean and tame. The shepherds are handsome and cultured. It all seems to belong to some golden age of myth and to times that never were. It could almost be another nursery rhyme. Jack and Jill, Mother Goose, and the baby Jesus. They're all presented in the same way. It's perfect for bedtime stories and Christmas cards, but it isn't a very meaningful story in the real world. The neat little baby in the manger seems ill-suited to deal with the problems of real life. What good is the manger story when you've just lost your job? Or how can that little baby with the halo help the hundreds of thousands starving in Somalia or the 14 million refugees in the world? And it suits the enemy's purposes well to make the incarnation of Christ so sentimental as to be unsensible, to trivialize the Christmas story, to make it so full of vague goodwill as to render it irrelevant, to rob the gospel of its power by turning it into just another fairy tale. Incredible, implausible, illogical, and therefore impotent. And there are thousands upon thousands of people who only know the Jesus of the manger. And because of that, they never consciously take him seriously. Yet, in the Bible account, the life of the real Jesus, even from birth, is genuine and stark. He was a real man who faced life's real problems every day, even from the cradle. And the message of the gospel is that he overcame them all by the power of his Father and that through him we can be overcomers too. I want to look a little more closely at some of the stark reality of that life. Again in Matthew chapter 2, even that early life. Take now that manger scene and insert this phrase, verse 13. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and escape to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up and took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until Herod was dead. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Hey, I take it back. Maybe there is a Frankenstein in this story after all. Mary and Joseph in the middle of the night have to slip out and travel 200 miles on foot just to preserve the child's life. The enemy was trying to destroy God's son from the moment of his birth to extinguish the light before it could shine upon the whole world. We need to take a second look at the manger and see the reality of the cold world that our Lord was born into. There was no special quiet on that night. The atmosphere in Bethlehem was tense and unfriendly. 
compelled by Caesar's tax law to travel to their hometowns and pay tribute. The people were rushing and shoving, most of them not thinking of God or even realizing that his son was being born. The Jews hated the Roman yoke, and tax time only reminded them of their bondage. And so the inn that night was overflowing with nondescript travelers. The accommodations were inadequate. The attendants were impatient. Folks were overtired and aggravated. Tempers were short. Peace is not what Jesus found when he came here. Peace is what he left to come here. He was born in a stable behind a barn. And no matter how you fix it up, a stable is a stable, is a stable. With all its discomforts and inconveniences and unpleasant odors. A manger is not a delicate, scented cradle. A manger is a trough for animal fodder, a stall. There was no glamorous tinsel and trimmings from storyland. This was real life, and Jesus was born in the thick of it. And as if that wasn't enough, the story becomes more gruesome still. Well, the Bible says when Herod realized he'd been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then the Bible says what was prophesied through Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. He was known as Herod the Great. And though politically he did accomplish some important things, personally he was an insecure and intensely paranoid man. Herod had little respect for human life other than his own. He was a bloodthirsty ruler who would just as soon kill somebody as spit in the street. History says at different points during his reign he murdered his wife, his mother, his eldest son, and two of his other sons. Augustus said of him that it is safer to be Herod's dog than to be Herod's son. He was mad with murder. At his own death, we are told, as he got nearer to death, he had a group of elite citizens in Jerusalem arrested and imprisoned. Then he gave orders that the moment he died, all of them were to be executed so as to make sure there would be tears shed in Jerusalem at his death. He was a madman. He murdered innocent children without discrimination. The story rivals any headline from today's newspaper. That is the world into which Jesus was born. A world in which from his birth, the enemy was trying to snuff out his life. Jesus came out of the womb fighting to survive. Therefore, he knows the struggles that we face down here, and nobody knows them like Jesus. Nobody understands unemployment like Jesus. Nobody knows homelessness better than Jesus. Nobody knows what it means to be hated, to be attacked, to be criticized, and to have to escape for your life. Nobody knows that better than Jesus. And hear me, church, we do the gospel a disservice when we present the picture of an antiseptic Christ too dainty to get his fingernails dirty. A God of refined tastes and delicate sensibilities who only appreciates cultured things but can't take harsh noises. 
When we fail to present him as he truly was, we disable the gospel of its saving power. And we cut people off from Christ at crucial points in their lives. It is not uncommon even for Christians to think that when their lives get too dirty, they can't come to Christ. Well, we have been conditioned to think that Christ only handles clean things and not the unclean. Don't be deceived by the mistold manger story. The God who came to save knows real life in all of its toughness and all of its trial. And as he rose above it all by the Father's power, so he enables us to emerge victorious above whatever it is that is pulling us down in this life. That's something to remember at Christmas time. He is the one to run to when our world comes caving in on us. I read this week a story of Thomas Dorsey, a great religious composer, and the occasion of the writing of his most famous spiritual. It was in August of 1932 and he was the featured soloist at a religious service in St. Louis. He left his wife behind in Chicago because her pregnancy was upon her and she was well along the way. And the story says that he had a second thought about maybe canceling his appearance, but because he had given his word, he decided to go. On the second night of the revival series, a telegram was handed to him with four devastating words written on it. Your wife just died. Thomas Dorsey ran to the phone and the message was confirmed. His wife Nettie was dead. Later that same night, the unborn baby died too, a boy. And in a single day, he lost his whole family. Dorsey's world fell apart. The story says that he was devastated and in his devastation, he turned to Jesus. He buried his wife and baby in one casket, and then he ran to the Lord who alone could understand him. And in his grief and in his sorrow, he sat down at the piano one day, and a melody came to him. And as he played it, words just came flowing out of him. And he wrote the famous spiritual Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Let me stand. I am tired. I am weak. I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand. Precious Lord, lead me home. Thomas Dorsey knew that nobody understood his grief more than Jesus. For Jesus himself had known such grief. The Christ of the Bible, the Christ of the Christmas story, is the Lord of heaven and earth who knows us in our deepest sorrow and in our deepest sin. There is a place that I love to read that I came across in my youth. As I was going through my own personal searching process and I found a passage written by an inspired pen where the writer says to the reader that Jesus Christ is such a savior who knows us so intimately and there is no page of our history that is too dark for him to read. There is nothing we have done that we have to hide from him. And he is not ashamed, in spite of our fallenness, to be called our brother. He came as a low man so that he might reach the lowest of persons and lift everyone up to God. It's an interesting thing in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. 
You know, the Old Testament is full of genealogies, but in the New Testament, all the genealogies come to a close with the ones leading up to Christ. Matthew in his book and Luke in his. And in Matthew's genealogy, he gives the list of the forebears of Christ. And a strange thing happens in that genealogy. Matthew lists four females, even though the system was patriarchal. And the four females he listed were females that some people would have left out of their list because three of them were sinners and one was a foreigner. He lists the name of Tamar as a forebear of Christ. Do you know who Tamar was? Tamar birthed her child by disguising herself as a harlot and lying with her father-in-law. The Bible lists Rahab in the genealogy of Christ. Rahab was the harlot of Jericho, a prostitute, but she was one of the forebears of the Lord. And the Bible lists Bathsheba as one of the progenitors of Christ, the woman who was taken by David as she bathed into his harem, the woman whose husband was murdered to cover up the king's adultery. Jesus is not ashamed to be associated with us even in our sin. He is the Christ who can reach us however low we have sunk. And at our lowest moment, that is when he is most near. That's something for us to remember at Christmas. This Christmas thing. If we're going to celebrate it, then let's celebrate it right. Jesus came into a foul, a foul climate, but he came to clear the air. He came low, as low as he could get, to be sure to reach everybody. He came from all sorts to all sorts, and he is still in the business of healing lives today. He conquers sin of every description, and he is not afraid to get down into the dirt of our lives and lift us up to his plane where the air is clear and our consciences can be clean and we can breathe the freedom of the love and power of God. But he meets us on our level and he's reaching out to us even now. May God help us to receive him so that he can come into our lives and make us what he desires us to be.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and evermore through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you.